the next case is a CUSAC versus CUSAC. Each party will have 15 minutes to present their argument. The council may reserve up to five minutes. Council Hall, would you like to reserve for a moment? I'll, I'll do the five minutes. All right, very good. I'll be keeping track of the time up here. I'll try to let each of you know in your initial time, we're down a lot, about a minute left. Rebuttal, I may not have time to do that, so I'm going to leave the initial time. I'll let you know, and I'll let you know about Mr. Johnson. The argument should be recorded. When you present the argument, please make sure you introduce yourself for the record. It's being visually as well as audio recorded, so if you could, please stay behind the podium as much as possible. Uh, and also speak loud enough so we can hear you and the recording can pick you up. I don't really have anything in this case that it would pertain to, but if you would be referring to a child or a victim or anyone, please do that by initials rather than their name uh, specifically. We have read your briefs and are ready to proceed now. My name is Sam Bradley. I represent the appellant, Kevin Cusack. This case started as a legal separation action filed by Mr. Cusack or Kevin, um, and ultimately both parties um, agreed to proceed, A, on Kevin's amended complaint for divorce and on um, Deborah's counterclaim for divorce. On October 2nd, 2018, after two days of trial, um, the trial court judge class issued an order. Um, initially, the parties appealed, realized that it wasn't a final appeal of order. That appeal was dismissed. I believe the appellant in that particular appeal was Deborah. Thereafter, um, the trial court prepared entries that it thought would correct the issues of final appeal of order. It, it did not, and so the second appeal that Kevin had filed was dismissed, and then ultimately we're here today on the third attempt by these folks to have this honorable court review it. The first issue deals with um, equity grants or stock options. Kevin, as an employee in the corporate world, receives restricted stock units. The trial court divided the restricted stock units that existed at the time the party's divorce. Ultimately, we went back to the trial court following the remand from the second appeal um, and entered into an agreed entry to handle that. The problem comes in on page 9 in appendix page 10 is a provision that provides for additionally Kevin shall pay to wife one half of any bonuses and equity grants that he should receive, less taxes, etc. The problem comes in, it's been recognized, um, in particular, Banning is the, the case that I found that confirms this, that equity grants or stock options are property. So what the trial court did is take after divorce property that Kevin might receive and say, okay, you're going to pay half of that after acquired property to your former wife, um, Deborah, as spousal support. I find that effectively a modification of the property division award, which violates um, subsection I of 3105.171. Can you explain something to me business-wise? Um, so is this a dividend from the restricted stock? It, well, because it, I'm, I guess I'm asking that question because then that is income, isn't it? Exactly. And the court reserved jurisdiction to modify spousal support. Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, if Kevin receives um, the restricted stock units as stock and they start paying dividends, mm -hmm. at that point in time, Deborah, if she felt it was a large enough dividend, could come in and ask the court. Your appeal isn't dealing with dividends here. Your appeal is questioning the ability of the court to award income that's received in the way of I'll call it that, you might not know the term, but income that's received as a stock equity during, after the divorce, as something that can be used for complex spouses. Well, in, in, it's not income until such time um, that it's exercisable and the portion that exceeds the amount of the value of that stock option um, exceeds the so let's say, let's say, just for, for our discussion, 2020, his company said, okay, we're going to give you a stock option. This is after the divorce. We're going to award you a stock option 
that is exercise 12021. Okay. And at that point in time, under this decree, I think wife would have said, wait a minute, when you get that stock option exercise in 2021, I want my half of that. Correct. In essence. And you're saying saying that is air, and that is, in essence, once that was awarded in 2020, that was only the separate property. It could not be considered for support. So that is correct. I, I guess I need to go further with this. Then you're arguing, too, that any income from that, it, so you're saying that still is income that is dividable. Well, any income. In okay. See, and that's the problem I have is we don't know what the income would be. Mm -hmm. And so the court's guessing that if there should be income, divide it. But the, in this particular judgment, the court didn't say income from any restricted stock units or equity grants. It said the grant itself, when exercisable, shall be divided. And that's the problem because it effectively continuously modifies the property division as time goes on. Every time Kevin gets a stock or an equity grant, effectively the court through a continuing in your, order. In your position, you found no case law that permitted that uh, particular grant of but it's a way of viewing spousal support as something that can be done in the future to accept stock options if there is. I, I found no case law to that effect. Now the Oregon case um, that this court issued in, in modified, um, I'm sorry, Oregon modified burner, <laughs> sorry, um, indicated that a interest in a company that was a separate piece of property, um, the court had a right to order that the dividends be utilized, which is where Judge Lansinger is coming from, I think. Um, those could be divvied up in the future, but the actual um, equity in that company couldn't be divvied up. And the difference with Oregon and Burner in this case, Oregon was a modification case, so time had passed from the time of divorce. Here we have the divorce decree ordering a division of future property that might be received by Kevin. It's almost as if Kevin takes some of his income that he received as his share of the earnings and bought a house and the judge says, ah, you gotta split that with um, your former wife. Um, the difference here though is rather than him acquiring it through his own effort, the company, in order to keep him as a good employee, or as an incentive to be a good employee, gave him the equity grant. And the Burner case recognizes that. Um, <clears throat> secondly, my second argument deals with the spousal support award. And this is where I think Burner comes into play. Um, in the Stepka case, which was a malpractice action, um, analyzed what happened there. The expert in step could testify, well, they would do a one for five um, analysis, so one year of support for every five years of marriage, and then you take the incomes, divide by two, and the difference between the two incomes would be the amount of spousal support. And step has said, well, that's not what Oregon or Burr indicates. The court has a duty to consider the statutory factors under 3105.18. In this case, when you read the judgment of divorce, the judge does a nice analysis for spousal support, the periodic payments each month. However, it almost appears as if it was an afterthought. She had her first draft, and I'm, again, this is how I perceive in reading this judgment. Did the first draft, did the periodic payments, then all of a sudden realized, oh, wait a minute, I have these bonuses I didn't consider, and I have this equity grants I didn't consider, so additionally, 50% of those items will, after taxes and other ex, um, reasonable um, deductions and retirement shall be paid to wife. So A, we don't know what she meant by that language of other necessary deductions. In fact, I'll, I'll read it. after taxes and after all mandatory and necessary deductions, such as retirement. I have no clue what that means. So if we have a bonus, and he's supposed to give his wife 50%, what's prohibiting him from saying, just deposit 100% into my 401k? And then we have litigation over, well, that wasn't um, 
a necessary or um, retired or, or an approved amount. So we have more litigation over what portion should be um, divided. But the bigger problem is it's, it says additionally. It doesn't say, well, upon further consideration of the statutory factors, this court thinks that 50% of the bonus. Had the judge said something along those lines, it would make it clear to everybody that she did consider the factors in, in dividing the bonuses and awarding 50%. By not indicating to anybody that she considered that, this is a Burner situation. Even though Burner dealt with the prior statute that said we have to look at fees, I still think that analysis in light of SEPCA is appropriate. You gotta indicate that you've considered these factors as she did with the periodic award. The word additionally bothers me um, in reading it because again, I see it as a situation where the judge had an afterthought and threw this in there rather than actually doing uh, the, the analysis that was necessary. And when you look at the numbers, by the time we take um, the $9,000 a month, and I have the analysis in my brief, um, Debbie gets 56% 56, 56 of the total um, of the period um, of the regular income. And then she gets 50% of the bonus income after all the, the, the unknown deductions. So I, I find that a bit significantly harsh, especially applying that formula as a okay, the time period we're talking about in 2018, prior to the law being changed, that spousal support was not income for spouse and a credit for husband. It was not necessarily uncommon to see a higher award to, to the receiving spouse if you're trying to do it 50% because they were going to lose some of the out-of-pocket money when the income taxes had to be paid and the spouse would have gotten some benefit uh, on his taxes when he filed that. So that would have been a, a normal calculation prior to 2019, it would seem yeah, not necessarily. Based, based upon the discretion of the court. The court has Correct. that discretion to, to make that determination once they look at all the factors. One of those factors being the taxes, one of those being the health of the parties. And the court went through it and looked at all the factors fairly in this case and, and made a determination for that initial award of here's his regular income. We, there's no dispute. The court reviewed the factors, looked at all of those, and made a determination after reviewing the factors. And keep in mind, we're not arguing the periodic payments. We're not saying that the court abused okay. its discretion on that. That's not part of my Okay, I, I, to some extent, when you were talking about he was at more than 50%, I thought you were. Well, so you're saying that part is, I, we're not really arguing that. We're just arguing the additional, that's where the error is. Yeah, as an aside, it's too high, but we're not arguing okay. that. <laughs> well, that, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so it, it becomes unreasonable, inappropriate, once you get into the additional support that the court didn't consider the factors. At, at the time, of, and I, it's been a while back, 2018, I know. <laughs> if you recall from the record, were the parties asking the court to, in essence, set up a tier one, two tier support, so in other words, order a monthly payment based upon what his regular income is, and then any bonuses that come up afterwards be divided to some capacity, or were they saying consider all that in the first instance? No, I, I don't recall seeing that there was any arguments for a two tier system. Um, again, that's why I see this as an afterthought. Um, a part of the second draft or third draft of the judgment, we throw in this, by the hopes, forgot about this. <laughs> again, that's how I'm viewing the judgment. I'm not trying to disparage the trial court judge, but I, I, I just see it. Once you start throwing in additionally, um, I, if she would have put in as part of the, the periodic payments, he shall pay 9000 per month and when he receives his bonuses, one half of those. Or do you, you have to additionally, plus after reviewing the factors under 3105.18, I find this to be appropriate for the yeah. additional money. You would say, okay, she clearly considered it, understood that sort of consideration. You still might be arguing abuse, but you wouldn't be arguing, hey, I don't know that she considered that. Co correct. And I think, again, that's why I find it to be an improper order. Um, and I do believe it's an abuse of discretion based on the fact that it's, it's simply a formula of this amount. So you are now into your rebuttal time, Council. Thank you. 
I'll, I'll save the rest of the time. Right. person with serious conditions, person faced with multiple sclerosis, it's a chronic condition, and you don't cure chronic conditions, you just hopefully live with them. And to, in any way, import, in any way, that Judge Glass committed an abuse of discretion it is a fallacy. It is not supported by case law, it is not supported by facts, and it's not supported by their brief, and it is not supported by the arguments that the appellant is making to this court. We are limited to the issues that we have brought forward in the brief and in the reply brief. First of all, as the judge noted, uh, we got this entry on before 12-31-18, and he gets a deduction dollar for dollar on his adjusted gross income for the monies that are paid to my client. Uh, Stereo decisis should only be tampered with when there is a clear showing that not following the law of a particular district court of appeal is appropriate. There is no stereo decisis, I think, any stronger in our favor right now than Oregon versus Oregon. It is a well-reasoned case. It is well-founded. And I, as opposed to the other attorney, uh, OG, uh, it's an afterthought that comes in a second. I, I find that, frankly, to be uh, very improper arguments made before the court to be bring up such uh, silliness. Justice, hard work folds in on itself. It's hard to describe. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, whatever the one justice said about pornography. Uh, you know, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I certainly know it when I see it. And this is justice, what has been done by Judge Glass. Uh, again, limited to the brief, again, oral arguments are generally uh, a discussion of, as appropriately they should be, of what's in the brief. And, you know, the, the notes, uh, no abuse of discretion. Uh, as the options, a mule already, she gets, she has to pay the tax for the money she gets. Twelve thirty one eighteen. There is no second or third draft. There is a judgment entry of divorce by a judge making competent rulings on competent evidence presented at the time of trial. Uh, what about the issue of the restricted stock? I'm sorry. The stock, the stock that he's arguing can't be divided in an alimony or rather it's separate property. Not true. Uh, it's not division of property. Do this is a spousal support case, as is in the brief. Do we have any precedent on that issue? Oregon versus Oregon. Oregon versus Oregon. Um, uh, page, uh, paragraph 26. It is not an abuse of discretion for the trial court to allow a wife to share in the success of the husband's business. Again, it's uh, in the Bergman case, you know, again, abuse of discretion uh, is not a horse show where close counts. It's plain and visible. This isn't plain and visible. There is no law on this. There is no statutory law that says, oh, gee, you can't do that. But the argument, what you're citing to me right now, is talking about a, a business that already exists, right? I'm sorry, again? A business that already exists. Again, I, I don't think that that argument exists at all. Uh, not in this case. Well, no. I think the, the, um, the distinction is, is if this is property, it is after acquired property, unlike that case. In other words, 
the use the use of the word marital and separate property get kind of confusing when you're talking about after acquired property. Of course, it's separate, um, but it can be used for support purposes. But my understanding is this isn't like that case because it's after after acquired. I could be incorrect, but that is my understanding of what the argument. If I've miscited something in my brief, I will apologize, but I will cite the following. In order to suffer the Ninth District Court of Appeals held for, uh, per ORC 3105.118, spousal support is to bring is to bring appellee to a reasonable standard of living in light of the standard maintained during the marriage, allowing a spouse to maintain the same standard of living as the old of the other spouse, and to continue to benefit from the paying spouse's success does not equal an abuse of discretion. Mr. Orgrim was paid, ordered to pay 50% of any employment bonuses he receives, which is the exact amount ordered by Judge Glass with a provision for appropriate deductions. Mr. Orgrim was ordered to pay 33% from his half million dollars of a property investment in a new business. Spousal support. Spousal support is this case. This is not a property division case. So you're saying that's about it's about equity and not whose Correct. property is whose. Courts of common pleas. They're not like you know municipal courts and so on. Courts of equity. What is justice? What is justice? That is equity. So if Mr. Kusek was to receive an inheritance of some size after the date of the divorce, and that was all in everyone's contemplation. Um, the court could divide that, that inheritance that from which it, wherever it came? No. Into the spousal? No. You, you, it's not property. It's being divided. And even, uh, I think, the, the spousal support sections are clear about what can be considered. Again, it would just be a separate income thing that where uh, it, it's not income. I understand that. But it's an ability to pay. You know, uh, you, your ability to pay has changed. If the if there is a need that exists, then my client would have to say, hey, listen, I've got a greater need than what the original order was. That's why there is continuing jurisdiction in this case. The continuing jurisdiction in this case is based upon the fact considerations uh, of the case. And those are all done. Uh, Oregon, it found the husband's stock in a new company was a separate property, but that it could be considered for spousal support purposes. Finally, it determined that for spousal support, husband was paid thirteen thousand five hundred twenty-five per month indefinitely, which again is the word indefinitely is never true in this. It's you know modifiable upon changes in circumstances. Indefinitely plus fifty percent of any income he receives or gains in the stock he acquired in the California company. This is precedent, and it is only looking at spousal support. It is not, again, I repeat, it is not a division of property case. Wasn't the company in that case owned by the husband? Uh, I was, no, it says, I, I can't recall that, so I'm not going to. Well, I'm looking at what it says here. On the stock he acquired in a California company, and that appears to be an exact quote uh, that we have on page 11. Uh, so I, I, I'll rely upon that. Again, requires that a disadvantage, again on page 13 of my brief, requires that a disadvantaged spouse receives sufficient spousal support to bring him or her up to a reasonable standard of living in light of the standard of living maintained during the marriage. This guy made three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a year. And the testimony in that case was they had spent it all, with the exception of a small amount of uh, bonuses and so on that he would receive after marriage and so on. I mean, but he spent everything. They had a small retirement account with uh, Schwab. <clears throat> it was all gone. They had a $300,000 plus year living expense that they spent. You know, I, I, we didn't know that there's any savings accounts. We didn't know there's anything else to be divided other than what was disclosed in that trial court. There wasn't. According to testimony, he made it, and they spent every doggone penny except whatever had been put into uh, some basically very small accounts. So again, there is nothing wrong with what 
what Judge Glass did. There is absolutely, I mean, you've got to, it, again, it's not horseshoes either. It's not a matter of being close. I mean, you've got to get a ringer on abuse of discretion, or you've got to get a violation of statutory law, or you've got to get a violation of precedent in this court of appeals. That is non existent. Neither of any of those factors exist in this case. And that's why Judge Glass did equity, why Judge Glass did justice. Interesting. Um, again, I, I, by the way, I believe that uh, another attorney is mistaken there. I think Mr. Cusack is the appellant in the other case, too. He said, like, the, didn't like what Judge Glass did. In any event, um, I would ask that this court would find that there is no abuse of discretion. Unless this court finds that there is an abuse of discretion and a clear violation of statutory or the prior case law that exists in this court of appeals. This decision should not be overturned. It should be honored. Trial judges have an entirely different, in their own way, uh, every time we come to the court of appeals, we're saying some trial judge made a horrible error. That there's a horrible thing that happened. There is no horrible thing that happened here. Equity was done, realizing that, again, the condition that she has is a continuing degenerative condition, realizing the spending of all of the marital monies that had been earned, with the exception of a small amount of money, I believe, a Schwab retirement plan, and there's another small uh, equity uh, uh, item of Pudro. Other than those two little Pudros that are out there floating around, which still did not get to come into action. They spent it all. They had the cruises. They had the lifestyle. They had paying for kids' college, you know. Uh, all of it that goes with that kind of money. I mean, that's a lot of money to spend. And that's a lifestyle. I always wonder if we made some mistake. Um, I understand everything is made by reason of law. You know, uh, it's not made upon you know what a defendant looks like or whether or not you know they walk in on their hands and so on, or they can walk in with it. With this, it doesn't matter. The client didn't want to be here. Uh, it's the law. The law favors what Judge Glass did. And every every point, there is no reason to change that. If he has modifications, such as he retires, he files. If he has less income than what he had at the time, the 300 plus thousand, modify. But take care of the one who is most disadvantaged by the divorce, the one who is unable to work, the one who has, requires continual medical care, the one who's looking at expenses. I haven't seen the cost go down since 2018 of any of the services that she requires that were testified to in that court, the help that she has to receive at home, the help that she has to receive going to doctors. Various uh, constant back and forth with, uh, I believe even there was some, maybe some broken arms and so on, or, and, and at that point in time, I can't remember the exact note of that in the transcript, but I don't want to do it. And one or more of you have read that transcript you will know that Judge Glass made the right decision. You will not have any doubt about it. You will know, K-N-O-W, it's like even in criminal law, all you gotta do is be guilty of God reasonable doubt. You don't have to actually be guilty. But I'm telling you that, again, I'm not dictating to you. Tom, you have about a minute left in your time. Thank you, Judge. Um, trial Court's Court of Equity. Every time we come to you guys, it's somebody made a mistake down there. Your lawyer screwed up and messed up his client, and the judge made a fatal error that equals an abuse of discretion. That has not occurred in this case, judges. Thank you. Thank you. With respect to um, Attorney Jones's argument, um, he mentioned or cited from Oregon, share in the success of the business. And he made some other 
um, quotes from that. Um, I think this goes back to Judge Lansinger's um, comment to me earlier or question to me earlier. Are you talking about dividends in Oregon? Yes. There was no division of the equity that Mr. Oregon received in that private company. It was the dividends, the success that generated those dividends that was being shared. So Oregon has some application, but not controlling. The application that it has is, did the court, in dividing the bonus by 50%, make consideration of the factors under 3109.5.18? No, I don't see that happening here. There's no reference to those. She did it clearly in the analysis for the periodic payments. Judge Hensel made a great comment about the inheritance. Um, would the court be able to divide that? In a sense, yes. Just like in Oregon, if the inheritance hypothetically is $10 million and Mr. Um, um, Cusack started generating a million dollars a year in unearned income, then guess what? Debbie could come back to court and say, hey, I want my spouse to revisit it. He's getting a million dollars a year in income plus his three or four hundred thousand dollars a year in earnings. But that's not the case here. The case here is the equity grants are not divisible because they were property. Now, if they generate income, guess what? Now they're divisible, the income can be considered for a modification support. So, and that's the part that I think Apple is missing in applying Oregon to this case, is because Oregon dealt with equity, you say, oh, okay, it's equity, let's divide it. But that's not what Oregon said. It said, let's divvy up the income from that equity. Mr. Cusack understands the seriousness of his former wife's health. He filed a complaint for legal separation, which is very highly unusual in a divorce case, for the husband to say, let's stay married but separated. Why did he do it? Health insurance. He wanted to make sure his wife was going to be protected through that. She filed a counterclaim for divorce, and at that point, it became obvious that one of them would be granted a divorce, so it got converted. I so I know we went a little longer, so you're about 30 seconds left in your time. It, and actually, that's a good time to conclude. Thank you. Thank you. The court will take the matter under advisement. We'll issue a decision in due course. When that decision is reached, it will be mailed to you by the clerk of courts. It will also be available on the high Supreme Court website. With that, I'd like to thank both of you for your presentation today on behalf of the court.